right there, right there. Wide belly up. This is the game. Yeah. It's a uh, cat and mouse. Smoked a turkey. <laughs> yes. He is down. He is freaking down. Said he shot an absolute giant. Fall obsession, baby. Well, welcome back, everybody, to another Fall Obsession podcast episode. I am Sam Thrash with Fall Obsession. Sitting next to me, my frequent co-host, the one, the only, you guys know him, Nick Powell. What's happening, buddy? Hey, not a whole lot, Sam. Glad to be here. Yeah, man. And we are once again sitting in the awesome man cave of our good friend Chance Nelms. Chance, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for coming out, guys. Well, we're uh, we're happy to be here. Yeah, lean into the mic. Lean into the <laughs> mic. I got you. I got you. <laughs> so much clearer. And we got another guest with us uh, here today, guys. His first time on the podcast, and that is uh, our good friend, Mr. Brody Aiken. Brody, welcome to Fall Obsession Podcast, man. Oh, thanks for having me. It's exciting. We're happy to have you, buddy. Um, got some uh, some awesome stories, some awesome stuff to talk about in this episode and episodes coming up after this. So, looking forward to it. And guys, you know the drill. Before we get into our content, um, we got to give a, a shout out to some other individuals. This podcast is brought to you guys by our friends over at Vapple Products. We're very grateful to our partnership with them. Quality attractant products at an affordable price for the everyday hunter, such as us and you. So we recommend that you guys go check them out, vapleproducts.com, and pick you some up. Give it a test, see what you think. A lot of content on our pages, too, to to back up our testimony. So, All right, so to kind of kick things off, Brody, this is your first time joining us here. Um, you had a pretty awesome mule deer hunt earlier in the year, and, and that's the meat of the discussion that we're going to get into here later today. But to to kind of start us off, Introduce yourself, give guys just a little bit of background on, on you and kind of your, your general hunting experiences, you know? Okay. Uh, my name's Brody Aiken. Uh, I'm a firefighter here in North Texas. I live down in Grandview in Johnson County. My dad was into hunting growing up and the bad thing is he kind of got out of hunting about the time I was old enough to start going. So I didn't have a lot of hunting experience, especially with, uh, whitetail or anything like that until after I was married so I was in my 20s when I started actually going hunting more and getting more into it so uh that's kind of my background as far as hunting I'm, I mostly hunt whitetails here in Texas and in the past few years kind of getting interested in going out of state to do some more big game hunts I've been a couple of three times elk hunting and mule deer hunting and this is actually the story you're going to hear is the first one i've actually got to kill so that's what made it so exciting for me yeah absolutely where we're in wyoming so uh we friend of mine from work ben jackson the, who you all know went last year with his wife and father-in-law and stuff and uh wanted to go back and it, it's with, uh, we went with Ishawa Outfitters out of Cody, Wyoming. Okay. Gotcha. So this was your first time hunting with them, or had you hunted with them in your previous experiences out there? Yeah, this was my first time to hunt in Wyoming and first time to go with the Ishawa Outfitters. Okay. Yeah. I gotcha. So you kind of took his recommendation and, and head on out there. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about expectations versus reality kind of going out there what what you what you thought you were in for um because i know you've hunted mule deer in the past so it, it, it wasn't a completely foreign concept for you um, but tell us kind of how that compared to to what you found versus what you expected going out there okay so yeah this was definitely a little bit different than your typical western hunt which is you know what what you think about the spot and stalk type deal uh so here where we went it was a wilderness hunt, which um, in Wyoming, an out-of-state resident, non-resident, has to go with an outfitter on a wilderness hunt. So we basically uh, packed in horseback 15 miles into the wilderness area there. Uh, it's very near to the Yellowstone National Park. And so the way they hunt is you're actually sitting on like a cliff or a knoll, and you're, you're watching the deer basically migrate from like down down a canyon mm -hmm. so it's not a lot of moving 
you're you're basically all day staying one place and just waiting for the deer to fall by. So that was kind of neat. But the other thing is, if you see a deer and you don't get a shot and he leaves, like you're not going to see him again. He's gone. Really? So the uh, there's no going hunting him back up. I mean, you got to make a decision fast. Is he a shooter? Do I want to shoot this deer? And you know, make it happen in a short amount of time within maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute. So that, um, that was different. And the other thing that was, it was, we hunted at 8,000 feet and it was Mm. cold, cold. We, uh, so that, you know, I felt pretty prepared as far as my clothing and equipment was concerned, but the sitting, sitting in the, on a cliff for, you know, 10 hours, that's definitely, you know, that's, it's kind of like what we do here, maybe sitting in blinds and deer stands. It's very akin to that more than the actual spot and stalk, which is what you think of with the Western hunting. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm, before we get into your actual story of this hunt, I want to I want to back up just a little bit because, as we've mentioned, you have had previous experiences hunting hunting mule deer. So, for the sake of just giving yourself a little bit more background and and. Uh, and setting the stage a little bit more. Tell us about your previous experiences, just, you know, briefly. Okay. Yeah, so I just, I love mule deer. I think they're cool. I just love, you know, the way they look, the the, the place. And I think the main deal is where they live. You know, uh, I just think they're awesome. And so my goal has been to go get to go mule deer hunting, you know, and hopefully kill a good one. Uh, last year was the first chance I actually got to go hunting. We went to Idaho it was another wilderness hunt with an outfitter horseback and it it was your spot and stock you know we left horseback we would stop in glass try to find mule deer you know does bucks uh and we hunted for six days hard and just did not turn any up so you know going it was a 24-hour drive to idaho so right it was you know that was it was an awesome place it was a cool trip first time i've done the backcountry hunt but you know not getting to even see one was was disappointing i would be lying to you if i said it wasn't yeah uh but it just so you know when uh ben called me and wanted to go the very next year you know within weeks of me coming back i was absolutely we're going you know i'm i'm in yeah so and i still want to <laughs> kill some more mule deer man they're still my favorite i oh, think yeah. they're awesome just the way they look you know and uh so having experienced the white tail where you sit in a blind wait on them to come if you don't get them one day hey maybe we'll come back tomorrow they'll they'll still be in this area compared to the spot and stock western hunt where you go and look at look for them uh glass them up which one do you prefer like having experienced both of them <laughs> Which one's your favorite? Man, that's like saying, that's like asking you to pick out your favorite kid. I like them both. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, uh, I, man, I like them both. Yeah. It's fun. And the, that's fair. The Western part, the West, the cool thing about going out to us to a Western state is the fact that it's an adventure. Yeah. And you're not going to just leave your house in Texas and drive to a trailhead and just take off and hunt. It's not really uh a possibility here so right that the adventure part of it is definitely part of the appeal so you know that's one of the reasons that it's fun to go out there and do that stuff and that i like so but man i, I mean i'm going to the deer at least this weekend yeah. so we're you know we're gonna go sit in deer blind and try to we're gonna see the same five bucks that we see every time we're there, and hope that that yeah. one that we saw one time on trail camera in the summer, he comes back by. I mean, I like doing that too. That's fun too to me. Yeah. So, so what, I don't, I don't, I don't want to pick. I gotcha. like them both. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, what time of year was your Idaho mule deer hunt? So um, that was the first week in October, and it was okay. a rifle hunt. I'm, I don't, I don't have a bow. I don't shoot a bow. Gotcha. So I'm a strictly rifle hunter and we'll that get was, into that in a little bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was um that was in that was in uh, october also okay so they were both in october yes both sir. years yep. and then uh how did the weather in idaho compare to the weather in wyoming uh they were both colder than texas but <laughs> wyoming was it on the weather 
it was unbelievable. They... It, was, it was really crazy. We rode in 15 miles, and there was, you know, no snow. It was, uh, you know, no snow in the landscape. Right. The, it was le- the weather was sunny and pleasant. Well, that night, it turns cold. It snows about six or eight inches. And so when I end up riding out, you, you ride 15 miles back out, and it's everything is snowed over. It looks like a Christmas card. So that was wow. part of the cool thing of going up there is you, is you had one experience going in, you know, your typical fall mountain scenery, the leaves are changing, the river's running, and uh, and then coming out, like I said, it looked like a Christmas card. And so that, in you know, I, I might be a glutton for punishment a little bit, but I, I like, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was awesome seeing that landscape in that situation. So, you know, that was, you know, that was part of the, like I said, it was an, it's an adventure. That was part of the yeah. fun part of it. That's cool. I, I think it's, I'm going to touch real quick. It's because I had my, my pronghorn hunt that I've gone on a couple years. It, it's interesting because you're talking about your love for both down here and up there. It, it's it's two completely different things. And and apples to oranges kind of. Yeah, it, it, it kind of is. And and I, I like, I haven't hunted mule deer. I want to, but pronghorn is the only thing I have to relate it to. But I had a successful year, an unsuccessful year, and even after the unsuccessful year, you know, I'm still, I'm still wanting to go back. I'm still wanting to do it because it's different. And then I think about all of our guys from up north or on, you know, out east, who came here, you know, to hunt with us in Texas, you know, last year on management hunt. They never hunted Texas before, and we're like, oh my gosh, there's so many whitetails around here. What yeah. the heck? I've, I've never hunted in a place like this. Yeah, they, it was really interesting. Yeah, to get it was their like flip flop. So it, it, it's, it's purely, it's based on where you're from and then obviously it like you said and you hit on the head apples to oranges in my opinion for sure you know. oh it's all about your perspective yeah exactly Absolutely. exactly that's what i'm getting at <laughs> <laughs> all right so let's dive in tell us about this hunt tell us about everything building up and and actually putting this deer on the ground okay yeah so the thing to remember about going on a western hunt is you have to plan it super early y'all i mean y'all know this uh wyoming is a draw state Uh so we had to draw the um the tag the outfitter assisted us with putting into the draw and i actually had a point from the year before that i had just purchased to try to start building up points in wyoming and so i drew drew the tag in may uh and then basically the outfitter's like okay we'll see you in october and that's it and so you know, he we talked about uh, the rifle and some of the gear and clothing. Quick question: So you said you you got a point one year. So is that a was that a preference point? Yeah, I don't I don't or remember. Is it like a preference point or a bonus point? Because there's a difference, isn't there? Yeah, I'm talking to the wrong guy. I don't know how <laughs> Wyoming uh, terms it. Gotcha. I know that in Colorado it's a preference point, but it might be a bonus point in Wyoming. Gotcha. I know that you know it helps increase your chances of draw. Do you so. know the difference? No, I don't either. Okay, I was just curious. But uh, so you know, he I did talk to the outfitter on the phone, and he kind of we talked about the rifle and shooting situations and some of my gear and be prepared for the cold and stuff. And so I felt pretty good, you know, going up there to a place I'd never been. I felt okay about uh, having the right stuff. And so we drive we drove up to Cody, Wyoming, and it's um. It's not that bad. I want to say it's like 16 hours. It's not terrible. Yeah, it, we we drove through Cody going up to Montana, and yeah, we it was about 16, 17, yeah. right in that and, ballpark. And, and I like driving. I like especially driving out west, places that I've never been before, or seen before. So I'm, I might be kind of weird in that way that I actually like driving that those places. So uh, we show up in Cody, and we meet the outfitter at a restaurant at two o'clock and we get our tags and he's uh we set up a time to meet at the trailhead uh the next morning the next morning was we were going to meet at 10 o'clock and the trailhead's roughly an hour outside of town so i get up in the morning start my truck click 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 it doesn't start oh man (laughs) and this is after i had I've done course. all the, um, I, I rotated my tires, I changed my oil, I changed my fuel filters. I, I thought I had this truck ready to go, you know, and this thing takes me to work every third day. I trust it. 
And I'm like, are you kidding me? The one time it the doesn't one start. Time. <laughs> it's crazy how much TLC your truck gets before a long hunting trip oh, like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, you'll drive around on flat tires for a month or yeah. whatever, but if you're going <laughs> right. hunting, you're like, we got to make sure this sucker's right. Exactly. So, you know, it was only 30, I think 30 degrees that morning. I'm like, oh my gosh, are you serious? The batteries are giving me problems. And sure enough, that's what it was. I, uh, I walked to an auto parts store in Cody, Wyoming, and bought some jumper cables, and found a oil, oil field services guy in the parking lot of the hotel, and he jumped me off. So then I drove to uh, the auto parts store to buy some batteries, and guess what? They were out. Oh. So I uh, <laughs> left my truck running, thankfully, and I drove to another auto parts store. And that's a hot tip right there. He, uh. They actually had the two batteries for my for my truck, so I bought them, switched them out in the parking lot, uh, and then actually made it to the trailhead on time. So, but man, I was so uh, annoyed slash I wasn't like super, I wasn't mad mad, but I was like, oh my gosh, we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. I hope we can make this happen, or I'll just drive this thing to the trailhead and kill it, and we'll figure it out next week. Right. That was my that was my last plan. I was like, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. <laughs> but we're not, you know, we're not going missing. hunting. <laughs> yeah, we are going hunting for sure. We got the whole rest of the year to figure this other deal out. Yeah. But so yeah, hot tip: bring jumper cables. <laughs> make sure you have a jack for your for your. Uh, tire or your truck in case yeah. you have a flat tire and i actually had my tools with me on the back of my truck so if it does nice. die and you have to drive it somewhere don't kill it that's right just leave it running you know they're either going to steal it or you're going to go hunting one or the other <laughs> like i said you can worry about that stuff later yeah the hunting's the important thing right, you get to right. go once a year you gotta go <laughs> exactly so so the, yeah tell that story that we did make it to the um we did make it to the trailhead, and I actually had dropped off my main luggage the day before, and they had it packed on the back of mules, and the, it was actually gone by the time I got there. And so the outfitter met us. There was four hunters total in our in the party that was up there that week. We put our uh, we put our rifle on the saddle, and we took off. So, and like I was saying, it um, oh when you go on these backcountry hunts they kind of limit your gear he's like bring one big duffel bag and if you got to bring your bedroll separate that's fine and then your gun and that's it because everything that goes in and out of of that uh of his camp is on the back of a mule uh, they have to bring the the feed for the mules mm, right in by mule so everything that's at this camp is came came in by horse horsepower so mm. that's pretty cool yeah so you you kind of got to make some choices as far as your clothing and gear uh you know i had no problem wearing the same clothes all week if i had to so that wasn't a big deal yeah it, the the cold was still kind of a concern because if you haven't really ever done it you you always have that question in the back of your mind like is this enough do i have the right stuff what if i get wet you know so there's another hot tip get quality rain gear because even if it's mm. not actively raining on you if you're riding through wet brush or snow you know you got to keep yourself dry yeah or at least have gear that can be dried out fairly quickly because you know 15 miles back there you're basically on your own you yeah. got you know if you get cold and wet and you can't get warm and dry you're it's really a problem it can be a problem for you you know uh, so that's another thing I brought this time I bought for this trip was I bought a Garmin inReach thing, the satellite communicator with the SOS capability if necessary. And, and, you know, I'm not a big worry guy. I don't really worry about things that might happen, but it was nice to be able to touch base with home yeah. through text messages with the Garmin. So that was a good investment, I would say. Uh, anyway, back to story. I'm rambling, but uh, no, you're fine. Uh, uh, just for the listener's sake, the difference between bonus points and preference points. Bonus points accumulate over time, so I guess you get like one a year. Preference points move you ahead in line to get drawn. Mm. So they both help you get drawn just in a different way. And each state has a different system. Right. Yeah. This is what he does every podcast. <clears throat> That's he, good. He Googles something, and 10 minutes later, he brings it up again. <laughs> yeah. <It's like laughs> a... when, I, when I listen to a podcast, and like they bring something up, and I'm like... 
Now, what the heck? I, I want to know what it is now. But then they mention it later. I'm like, oh, there like, it is. You're like Jamie on Joe Rogan's. He's always <laughs> Googling stuff. But it's weird stuff usually. Yeah. You're our Jamie. I'll be our Jamie. Or All you're right. Yanni. <laughs> yeah, Yanni. So. Yanni Chumani. Anyway, it's a, so we, so we're, we're riding in. It's a, basically a four hour ride, 15 miles. Uh, you're going up. We follow, you follow a river. You go up through a pass and you end up at the outfitters camp and the outfitter leases the camp from the forest service and he has his own area that no other outfitters can hunt so that's nice you know it's a fairly large area it might be 200 square miles of this drainage river drainage so i mean private citizens can go in there and hunt it but no other outfitters can set up on his camps so that's cool, and we get there, and they'd already had um, bow season for elk, and they actually had a sheep, a bighorn sheep hunter in there yeah. earlier in September that they actually killed a really nice ram. Oh, nice. And uh, so we get there, and the camp is set up. There's a, you know, there's a temporary corral for the horses with a electric fence. We, we're sleeping in canvas wall tents. There's a cook tent. There's a dining tent. You know, so everything's set up ready for us there's cots there's a stove in our tent that we can feed and warm our tent up before you go to sleep so uh the outfitter you know there's a cook there that splits wood and cooks cooks the meals on a wood stove and cooks three meals a day for you uh, packs you a lunch for when you're actually hunting so we show up, get our gear kind of secured and ready, get a game plan. We eat dinner, go to bed early. You know, like, you know, we get up at 5, 4.30 to 5 to eat breakfast and get what on. Kinda, the... What kind of meals were they cooking Man, out there in the in the back country? We had pancakes one morning and really? bacon so and cool. eggs, biscuits. Uh, and they fed us at night, you know, chicken fried steak. They fed us spaghetti one night, um, pork loin one night. And the amazing thing is, is this cook cooks like a pie from scratch and he cooks it on the on top of a wood burning stove that came in on the back of a mule <laughs> so it's like and this is good and That's you know impressive. you know how it is when you're hungry when you're hunting you're hungry yes. yes you spend a lot of calories you're sitting still a lot so you get hungry but i mean this food is good it's like mm -hmm. legitimately good so that's kind of oh, i think when you go out to one of these deals it, food always tastes better out at the deer lease or when you're hunting sure. and stuff and yeah. that man up there it's no it's no different same deal do they uh do they pack water in or is it just like out of the stream oh no, yeah we drank we drank it straight out of the creek yeah that's cool yeah so i guess that it's so high up there and that the maybe it's melting and yeah, coming down this creek and yeah. it's fairly safe and i drank it all week and i didn't have any problems that's so. good Sorry, keep going. We uh, <laughs> so we we sleep, we get some rest, and we uh, like we they they did tell us about the weather. You know, hey, it's it's probably gonna snow tonight. Um, if you hear us beating on your tent, we're just knocking the snow off of it so it doesn't collapse. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, they came by two times in the middle of the night and knocked all the snow off the top of our tent. Dang. And uh, how much snow did y'all get throughout the whole trip? Man, I think it snowed about six or eight inches that first night. And then the next day, it snowed probably another six or eight inches. Wow, it's crazy. And then I had heard that it snowed a lot more. And that's that's kind of what limits them is they have to pull all that stuff out of the backcountry. They can't leave it. Right. So I think they said it took 48 mules to get all the stuff off the mountain when the season was over. But so that's the next insane. morning, we wake up, we eat breakfast, and we, we, we ride about an hour in the dark to – to the uh basically the stand or where we're gonna hunt and it basically was kind of uh you're you're sitting on basically a cliff and you're overlooking uh, basically one side of a valley there's a mountain across the creek that you can see but it's way too far to shoot and so uh we we set up and almost immediately deer are coming are filing through you can see probably roughly 600 yards from where they would appear on the right to where they filter through the trees to where you would finally lose sight of them to the left and uh some of the deer would just walk straight through as fast as they could some of them would come they would appear they'd get in some trees and mess around stop turn around they you know they they do what deer do you know 
that's kind of neat. They they do kind of behave. If you're familiar with white tail behavior, mule deer will do the same thing. Mm. You know, they're mill, they mill around. They the does fight each other, and uh, you know the the does mess with the fawns and push them out of the way, and you know get the best feed and stuff. So it's if you've been white tail hunting here in Texas, you kind of it's it's kind of the similar behavior. Yeah. So <clears throat> we end up, you know, we get there before six in the morning and we're set up and we're hunting and uh throughout the day we saw roughly 120 deer and with uh like 15 of them being bucks and basically you had to they had to have four points on one side to be a legal buck Mm. and we saw you know just a couple that were even legal to shoot and one the guy the guy that was with us said you know hey there's one he's okay he goes i wouldn't shoot him on the first day so i took his advice and this is midday and so we let him walk and uh and so y'all are just sitting like because you said you're on one side of the valley you can see mountains so y'all are just sitting in one spot yep all day Yep. okay yep and the guide uh starts a fire makes coffee dang <laughs> so you know That's awesome fire always makes you feel good oh yeah so it's nice to kind of warm up, walk around, uh, drink a little coffee, lift your spirits a little bit. And so we, we hang out all day, you know, and we're just kind of, they kind of come in waves. So, uh, you know, it's getting to be evening. It's roughly five o'clock and we're like, well, we're not see we hadn't seen anything in a few minutes, you know, 30, 45 minutes, any deer at all. Let's start kind of packing up, thinking about getting off this mountain and so, man, I pack up my binoculars and my backpack, and the only thing I still have out is my rifle. And sure enough, hey, there's a deer. I'm like, <laughs> okay, so I don't have, like I said, I don't have my even my binoculars. Mm-hmm. The guy hands me his. He's like, hey, look, there's a deer. You know, a buck. He's pretty good. And so I'm looking at him like, oh yeah. And it's getting dark. I'm like, oh. Yeah, maybe I have to think about shooting that one. So he <laughs> falls through the through the trees. And uh, he I, he kind of pops out, and I get a pretty decent look at him, and I'm like, oh yeah, he's 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 a pretty good one, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm like maybe I'll I'll shoot him, and so I get my gun out, load it, kind of get set up on some shooting sticks. I'm shooting downhill, and I start. I don't have my range finder; it's already put up. And the guide starts kind of ranging things for me, and so I dial my scope on my rifle. I'm like, okay, if I see if I get a shot, it's going to be about 300 yards. And so uh, he kind of comes out. Of course, then he starts walking directly away from me. I'm like, and then I get a good look at him. I'm like, okay, yeah, he's, I'm going to shoot him if, mm-hmm. I, if I can. And so he finally turns, and he's, I've been watching him for maybe two minutes. And he's going to the left, and he's almost to where, going out of sight to where we're not going to be able to shoot him. I feel really good about my setup. I'm steady. I'm sitting on my sitting on a rock and my my guns on some shooting sticks pointed downhill and I feel really good and I tell the guy he's sitting to my left I said if you stop him I'll shoot him and so he gives him the good old <laughs> just like we do here in Texas you know and he stops and throws his old head to the left and looks right at me and I send it and uh you can hear it you can hear the the hit yeah and so the guy's like you got him you got him and uh he goes Man, I love it when Texans come up here. They know how to shoot. <laughs> well, there, was right. some, there was some colorful language in there that went along with that. But, uh-huh. uh, and I felt really good about the hit. He goes directly down, and he's kind of kicking a little bit. And they said, put another one in him. And so I put, I put another one in him, and he, he's still kind of flopping. Well, he starts sliding down this slope. Uh-oh. Mm. And I don't know what's across down this slope. It might, right. I don't know, you know, I don't know. And there they said, uh, well, he fin- he stops. He's, he kind of leaned up, come up against a tree, and he stopped. And so I kept watching him. Man, I was so excited. I was like, oh, I can't believe this happened, you know. <laughs> People always say, you know, you shot one of the first day. I'm like, absolutely. You know, I'm not going to risk yeah. <laughs> like, like what happened last year and not even get to see another one or whatever, which right. was pretty unlikely. But, you know, I was like, I felt fine with it. I was totally okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I would be. Uh, what is it they say? Never pass on the first day what you'd shoot on the last. Boy, I'm know? a big believer in that, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm a big believer. People, you know, don't, you know, 
don't have any regrets. I'm like, you can always come back next year. You know, the only, you know, that regret on my only last one year, yeah. if he has a little ground shrinkage or whatever, but no, I'm, I'm, I've always, I've always had that. Yeah. And I think my kids have it worse than me because they want to shoot the first thing they <laughs> shoot, shoot every day. You know, so. <laughs> but, uh, so we, it, we pack up, it takes 15 or 20 minutes to pack up the horses and mules and to go downhill and to go down to where he was. And he was wadded up exactly where we left him or where we thought he was. And man, to being the first, you know, get to lay your hands on a deer or a, you know, basically something you've been thinking about for years. Yeah. And man, it's a cool feeling. You're, it's super exciting. You're like, and you, it's almost, you kind of, I stopped that the, the sun was basically down at this point. The stars were up. I'm, there's snow everywhere. And I'm sitting here on the side of a mountain in Wyoming in a wilderness area holding a mule deer. It's like, man, this is awesome. It was, I was so, so pumped, so excited. <laughs> awesome. I bet, man. But, you know, and Every, then. Everything you, you imagined it would be. Yeah. That moment. Exactly. Yeah. It was, and I, I really tried to, you know, try to enjoy it. Like, hey, we only, you know, this is, this is fun for, this is what we do. This is what makes us happy so you got to you know take it all in and yeah. it sounds kind of lame or sappy or whatever but i was really trying to you know soak it all in you yeah. know so i think anybody that has a you know a passion for hunting gets where you're coming from yeah i mean and that's that's what i'm trying to convey i guess and, but then like they say then the work begins right and so i get to looking at the deer and i was aiming right behind his front shoulder right in the old heart and lungs like you know, everybody tries to do, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm like, well, there's not a bullet hole here, and I get to looking at him, I look at his face, and the only thing that I can think of what happened was he, he was cut on his left side of his mouth. He almost had like a joker smile. So basically, what I think happened was, and there was a bullet hole in his neck, basically, I shot, and it grazed his face and went in his neck. And that's that's where I hit him, and the other time I shot, I didn't hit him. No, that kidding. first shot is what took him out. It just took him, took him a second to finally expire. But Dad, come. and so that kind of made the decision for me as far as like, are we going to shoulder mount this deer or are we going to euro pin mount this deer? And he had, like I said, he had about a four inch cut from his mouth to his ear. That's wild. On his left side from from that bullet grazing him before it went in his <laughs> neck, and I was like, well. Guess we're European mount this one. We don't have to worry about caping them out. So, you know, that kind of made one decision for us. So, uh, and the other thing about this area is it has grizzly bears. I was, that's what it was going to be so, a question of mine. I was, you know, I had bear spray. I was pack, I had a 454 revolver on my chest that I borrowed from a friend. And he was really worried about the bears. He's like, no, you have to have a gun. You have to have a gun. I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. So I had, and so then now I'm, it's dark, it's cold, and I just shot a, there's a 260 pound mule deer laying here on this snow, and I'm like, oh man, we better watch out for bears, the bear by the side, he wants this deer, you know, and so immediately, uh, the, you know, after we took some pictures, the guide was really good about setting the deer up and take, trying to take some quality pictures, you know, which I, it's, it was one thing I like to do. You know, I like to be able to yeah, for take sure. time and have a quality picture if you, if you can. And so then we immediately got to butchering. We did the gutless method, which is also different when there's six inches of snow and you're laying <laughs> and you're on the side of a mountain, literally the side of a mountain. Yeah. yeah. If the deer's wanting to slide down every time we move him. So between the guy, shout out to Mike and me, we, we, uh, we quartered the deer up, pulled the back straps, pulled the tenderloins out, cut his head off, pack him on a mule, and then, you know, then we're back to camp. That's so awesome. We roll into camp at ten thirty that night after all this. Dang. So oh. but it was really cool. It had been cloudy all day, like I was saying, but after the sun went down, it was clear as a bell. And mm-hmm. you could you know, you know how it is when you're out in the wilderness you can see every star yeah mm-hmm. the moon was fairly bright so it was it was really cool and like i was saying i was just trying to enjoy that ride back you know i'm like yeah. well i'm done hunting for at the, on this trip so i might as well enjoy this ride out <laughs> as much as i can so so. how long were y'all out there 
It was six days, you said? Uh, it was going to be a total of six days, you okay. know, four days hunting, and I ended up shooting on, shooting on the first day. Right. So basically my hunt was over after that. So uh, did you have to wait on the other guys to kill? So another guy with a different guy shot a buck about lunchtime that first day. Okay. And so he's in, they're in camp whenever we get back. And uh, I decided, you know, it was it was going to get colder. And they're like, are you going out tomorrow? I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to sleep in. I'm going to hang out at camp. So I, I slept in the next day, you know, hung out with the cook, talked to the other hunter and the other guy that who was done. And uh, so we hang out at camp, you know, tell a lot of stories. You learn a lot about, you know, their kind of life on the, you know, when they're not in hunting camp, you know, what they do on the, the rest of the whole year. So that's kind of neat. Right. And so their second day at dinner, the um, the other hunter, he was from uh, Washington State. He says, you know, I, I'm going to, if y'all take me, I want to go down tomorrow. And so I said, okay. I was like, and I, I know, the, I saw the weather. It's going to be cold, cold and snow, you know, below zero cold. And mm. I said, hey, if you're going down, I'm going down. <laughs> and so day three, and they said, that's fine. You know, the guy needed to go down and get some stuff done before the next group of hunters came up. One of the, one of the guides. So, uh, day three, we wake up, pack some mules and, uh, we ride out, we ride, we ride out. And, uh, the other two hunters, they stayed for another two days. Well, one of the other hunters, uh, he rode with me. He's, a uh, also from this area so he rode up to wyoming so i i I just stay in cody for two days in a hotel and i wait on him to come down on the basically the sixth day so uh hung out in cody wyoming watched football ate pizza got (laughs) got clean got warm yeah and uh it was actually nice because I got a hotel room and I actually could bring my gun in. I brought all my gear in and dried everything out, you know, cleaned everything up for the most part. Mm. And so I wasn't actually packing wet, you know, from melted snow or whatever. Right. So it was nice to actually have a chance to get everything, uh, you know, ready to, for the trip home. And, and Nick knows this, but I'm, I'm kind of... OCD about stuff, packing stuff and having everything in its little rightful place. So it gave me a chance to, you know, I actually felt good. Like, oh, I didn't leave anything up there yeah. and I, everything is packed up the way it needs to be for the trip home and everything. So what did you do with the meat during this time? So the meat got to stay, it stayed up on in camp. Okay. And they actually hang, hang it on this 20 feet tall A-frame to keep it out of the reach of bears. And it is, it's probably a quarter mile from, from the camp. Hmm. So the meat and the head stayed in, up there on the mountain, and like I said, it was below zero. Yeah. So it it was frozen solid the oh, entire yeah. time. And so uh, the the last day when I went back to the trailhead to pick up Steve, the other hunter, uh, loaded my meat and my head, and uh, oh, so you went back up? Went back to the trailhead and roughly an hour from okay. town gotcha. to pick Steve up. Gotcha. Because he rode with me, so. I, would, I was, could have told him, like, hey, rent a car. I'll see you in Texas or whatever. But I was like, ah, oh, you know. What, she part was te- on, she, what part of Texas was he from? Uh, he lives here in the Metroplex also. Oh, really? So, okay. yeah, he lives in uh, gotcha. Hazlitt. Okay. So, oh, nice. Yeah, so it was nice to pick him up and get everything loaded and started headed home after that. Awesome. That's crazy. So how long is the uh, is the season, like mule deer season in Wyoming? Uh it goes by region. I think they, I, I know that that the outfitter runs four hunts. Okay. And they were all, you know, you, you pack in, you hunt four days, you have another day to pack out. And then they, there's a day between where they come down and wash their clothes and get everything ready and, to go back. And I think they do that four times. Gotcha. That was, that's where I was getting at. And was basically, I think it's how many times maybe four that? weeks or 30 days. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, we were, I think the third of four hunts and for for that outfitter and uh they were saying that that just based on the timing they expected us to see the most deer and like the guys that were there the week after he said you might see bigger bucks but you're going to see way fewer deer so Hmm. in the week before 
it was it wasn't as cold and it rained the entire time. Oh, and he said terrible. it was pretty miserable. <laughs> like it was you know thirty seven degrees and raining for that entire week. Mm. And I was like, oh man, I'm so glad I wasn't there. Right. I don't like I don't love being wet and especially when you can't get super dry and warm. So and I below would, zero conditions. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. would I would I will take the snow over the just wet. You mm-hmm. know, so I would, the timing worked out really good for us. Awesome. Yeah. Based on that, what did uh, what all went into picking that outfitter? Like, what what did kind of research did you do, or did you do any at all? Oh or? yeah, so I didn't do any. Uh, <laughs> I just went basically on Ben's recommendation. They okay. they were there the year before and had high success. I think there was four of them that went, and they all killed a buck. And he told me he said, you know, you're gonna see a lot of deer. And I think the largest deer they killed the year before was his wife killed a like 160 inch mule deer, which isn't which is good, but it's not a giant, you know, a true giant. Right. Yeah. This place is the the region, the area is known for a lot of deer, but not giants. You know, there's always the chance you could see a, a true giant, but that was not part of the expectation for me. And you know, being my first uh, deer I'm totally happy with the one I that yeah. I did get. Oh yeah. And so I kind of knew going in. You know, there was a good chance I was going to be able to kill a deer, but the expectations as far as, you know, antler or rack size was, you know, pretty, pretty mild. So, but I, man, the trip was awesome. Cool. You know, and I, I, I liked the horseback aspect too. Yeah. It was, it was really cool. The, the outfitter had outstanding, uh, stock out, you know, animals, outstanding tack saddles and stuff and, uh, just everything uh, this guy has a top notch outfit in general so which was not my experience with the one i went on the year before mm. it was pretty much a greasy sack outfit you know very <laughs> war you know that's old cowboy term but very you know wore out stuff kind of kind of run down a little bit yeah i mean which is okay it kind of gives you some you know ambiance or some flavor but <laughs> Some of the stuff was pretty busted up. Yeah. So this going with this outfitter was very nice because he had top notch stuff. That's awesome. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, since you killed on the first day, you kind of had uh, some time to get to know the outfitters a little bit, get to know the cook, see what they did for the rest of the year. What kind of what do they do for the rest of the year? Oh man! So Steve and I were talking about this on the way home. It's like they don't have jobs like we do. They kind of just go from one thing to the other. Like one of really? the guys frames houses, and one of the guys uh, was is a cowboy in Montana, and he cowboys all year long, you know, taking care of cattle, and then he just goes and guides for three months, and then he just goes back to cowboying, hmm. and some of them work in the oil field, and it's like not having a job is not a big deal to them. They're like, oh yeah, we'll figure something out. I don't know what I'm gonna do after the season. Something will come up. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, that would give me anxiety, you know. <laughs> sure. They For have, sure. you know, they have houses and families and stuff. Uh, so and I'm like, ask. man, I'm my like, wife man. would kill oh, me yeah, if I absolutely. just like, well, I don't have a job right now. I'll try to find <laughs> something next week or whatever. <laughs> but it's it's only the, you know, they it's a slower pace out there. It's really awesome. I'm sure, they've been doing it for a while though. And they have, yeah. man. Uh, one of the guys. Uh, was from Montana, but he moved to moved to Alaska for four years. And was a guide in Alaska, and he started naming off the some of the stuff that they hunted and some of the stuff that he personally got to kill as a resident of Alaska. And it's like, you know, you, you joke about it, you think about it, oh, maybe I'll just move to Alaska. Well, this guy did it. Yeah. And it's like, I can't believe it. You know, it's crazy. It's <laughs> wow. just totally, it's just something that you don't feel like is even an option for, for me or for you. Right. I mean, I know your wife, she's like... <laughs> Yeah. She's like, no, yeah. no, no, we're not moving to Alaska, Nick. Come no, on, no you know. Way. But it's not a big deal to these <laughs> she likes guys. Our life. It's not a big deal to these guys, and that's awesome. I'm, I'm like, it's kind of cool that that's still an option out there, and that people get to do that stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. And absolutely. Good for them. It's cool. You got anything else specific you want to talk about about it? Man, if you're planning a western hunt, uh, I'd say go for it. Uh, save your money. My deal with going with an outfitter, you know, it was required in Wyoming. But uh, I don't know. You can kind of put together a hunt. I'm sure y'all talked about this before. You can put together a hunt for, you know, not extravagant prices. Yeah. Man, just go. It's. I think it's worth it. The adventure 
is uh, adventure is worth it. And I'd say if you're going out there and you're going to be 15 miles from a road, you know, uh, plan accordingly. Take good stuff. Don't <laughs> don't take your uh, make sure your truck batteries are yeah, working right. For sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask what was the truck situation when you when you got back? Everything oh, squared away. I was so I was actually I thought about it a lot, and I you know, and it was um, we got. It was, you know, 10 degrees when we get to the trailhead, and she fired off first crank. And I was so Ooh. proud. Of you. I was so proud. I said, uh, I said that's my you. truck. I said, thank you, Jesus. You know, yes. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't have been out of options, but it would have been, it would have been a little, took some doing to get her figured out. But, yeah. Yeah. you know, it, she, she fired right off, and nice. I was so proud of that truck. So proud. <laughs> I'm never getting rid of you. So You're my boy. But, uh. Yeah, definitely. No, you know, don't don't go up there and freeze to death. Plan accordingly. Invest in your gear. And, you know, you don't have to have best of everything, but take good stuff, stuff that you can count on. Uh, you know, and I wasn't super worried about bears. I knew that it was a uh, uh, could possibility to see some bears. And the next day, the day that I stayed in camp, they. Saw four grizzlies, one of oh. them at ten yards, and they ran Whoa. him off, hollered and ran him off. And uh, so I was, I was a little sad that I didn't get to see a grizzly bear, but I wasn't that sad that I wasn't <laughs> ten yards away from a grizzly yeah, bear. Yeah, right. real. Just want to see one like over uh, there, not they, right the here. The first thing we, the first the, before we left out from the trailhead, the first morning going going in, the outfitter said, uh, "Bears are a real thing. They're you know." It's a possibility we'll see some. If we see a bear, you need to listen to me. If you sh- have to shoot at a bear, shoot until there's no bullets left. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to lie to you. The next drainage over, there was a bow hunter, got mauled, and they had to get a uh, helicopter to fly him out. He, did, he didn't die, but he was chewed up pretty bad. Oh, crazy, just, man. You know, a few weeks before. And so that kind of put it in perspective like, uh, oh, yeah, this is, you know, this is real. I'm not a big fearful scared guy but it's like oh it's this is a totally different deal you know oh, this is not sure. a concern back home <laughs> yeah you, yes. you read stories or hear about it here but when you're actually in the environment where it happens oh yeah yeah it adds a sense of realism to so it for sure. definitely so. you know you respect them i think uh so i i, I kind of like the fact that they're out there still but i don't necessarily want to tangle with one right definitely not but uh so I, that that was a different perspective that you know, I'm not used to. Yeah. Cause like here I walked to my stand in pitch black and like the worst thing I have to worry about is like a giant hog or something that yeah, tripping on an armadillo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like not a grizzly coming out of the woods. Oh, and they said, man. uh, man, yeah, I said one of the bears, she was mad, mad, like just bristled up, did some false charges to him, got within 30 yards and, uh-uh. and I'm nope. like, I'm out. So I don't know. It, it's a little different. It's pretty neat. That's crazy. For sure. I did have one more question. I just thought of it, but I didn't type it down. Um, you mentioned it a little bit uh, with the uh, with like them packing everything in on mules and everything. So how was the camp set up? Like, what did y'all did y'all stay in like canvas tents or what? What was it? So the um, uh, the cook tent and the dining tent were your old school canvas out wall tents okay and we stayed in basically the newer version of that it was basically a nylon version of a uh outfitter tent and it had a stove in it but to me it didn't stay quite as warm Mm. but they do i think pack down a lot smaller and lighter because that canvas gets really heavy especially when it's wet or whatever yeah that makes sense so since they have this certain area uh in the mountains they pack all that stuff in first. Mm-hmm. They don't pack all that stuff out every single time. No, they just they, swap out hunters right. for each hunt. That's okay. right. Yep. That's all I need to know. Gotcha. Well, unless you got anything else, Nick, which I you don't. just said you don't. So, <laughs> Brody, every time we have somebody new join us for a podcast, um, we got some questions that we ask in closing. Okay. So, We'll uh, we'll hit you with those. Nick gets all excited every time. So I like hearing people's answers. It's yeah, pretty neat. That, that, that's not hard, and there's no test at the end. So <laughs> um, the first one, the first question we ask is, what is your favorite hunting or outdoor memory, and why? Oh, 
I'm going to get sappy on you, Uh-oh. but um, so I have two boys. I'm 11 year old and a seven year old, and I wasn't there the for the first deer my 11 year old got to kill three years ago. When, I guess he was nine, and he. Uh, Chances that we hear crying. <laughs> So I, I was at the fire station and I got a text that he got to kill his first deer and I was like, you know, you have your normal dad, you're you're proud, you're happy, and so I, I missed out on that one. Hmm. But this year, um, this is after the mule deer hunt. You know, we went youth weekend and my uh, seven year old cord, he was he was going after a certain buck and didn't get a shot on youth weekend. Well, um, two weeks later. We we get to go as a family to the deer lease here, uh, and he he shoots a nice buck and it, being there, you know, I was in a different. He was with my father in law, and I uh, I was in a different blind. But he he calls me on the phone, and I'm four thirty in the afternoon, and I'm I'm like, oh, I hope I know what this is. And yeah. He's like, Dad, I killed a buck, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, awesome. And I we immediately get down, we you know we pack up, we drive the Can Am over to where they are, and you know he's just. You know, super pumped, and and uh, everybody there is like super pumped for him. One of the other guys who's not even who hunts on the lease, he gets out of his blind, and he comes over there because he's <laughs> awesome. he's excited cool. for him too. Yeah. So, and just so being able to be there for his first buck, you know, and I, I know it's maybe cliche and maybe a little lame, but that's probably my favorite hunting memory that yeah. we were. And actually, my wife was there, my other son was there, and we were all there as a family. And it was that's cool. cool. Yeah, to, uh, that's not to lame be there at all. For that. That's awesome. That is cool. It's a solid buck too for his first buck. This uh, is first yeah. deer ever, right? First deer ever. Yeah. And our, my rule is, you know, they have to be able to hold the gun, aim the gun, shoot the gun on their own. You know, and he's been working at it hard for a year. <laughs> and you know, I, y- y'all will find out. But with your second kid, everything comes a lot sooner than with your first kid, just because they think that they're big enough and tough enough to do whatever, and they usually are. So trust them. But. You know, my uh, oldest, he was eight when he shot his first buck, and Cord was set is seven when he shot his first buck. And he, 80 yards, smokes this deer, one shot, the deer drops in his tracks. Wow. That's awesome. Uh, he he shot, shot a little compact 243 and just smokes this buck. And he, he was uh, he's eight point, uh, he was a 19 and 3 eighths inches wide deer, oh, nice. and ends up scoring 133. And yeah, spoiled. I, one he really is, right and I'm there. like, man, I'd have shot that deer. So, <laughs> but no, they're good boys, and they, you know, they really love the outdoors. So it was cool to be there for that. For That's sure. cool. That's awesome, man. All right, <laughs> moving on. Um, second question we have is, what is a or multiple top bucket list hunts? that you have not gotten to go on yet oh man we talk about this at the fire station all the time so Mm -hmm. uh probably my you know i'm starting to get into waterfowling a little bit and so i'm kind of a little bit fired up about going duck hunting and stuff but i think my number one and it might take me the rest of my life is uh, i want to go to sonora mexico and shoot a mule deer 200 inch mule deer and I thought you were going the waterfowl route. With, I know. With no, how you started that. Quick no, no, I'd like to shoot a an elk one day. I've been elk hunting, kind of the DIY deal, public land in Colorado. Me and everybody else apparently yeah. was there. <laughs> but uh, no, I, a 200 inch mule deer. And I hate to, you know, I feel so lame about putting a number or, or trying to be a trophy hunter or whatever. But I just think that. That would be the tops for me, man. Having that on the wall at the house and be able to see that every day. Yeah. That's that's my goal. That, that's I'd awesome. really like to go down to Mexico shooting a mule deer. That's awesome. All right, third and final question. And you kind of already hit on this a little bit when you were talking about, you know, investing in, in the right gear and stuff like that. But we always ask um, for one big piece of advice relevant to what we're talking about so what's what's a big piece of advice you could have for somebody who is about to go out and do uh, a backcountry muley hunt like this uh so we heard it from the guides apparently they had some guys the week before that couldn't shoot and missed i think i think they said one guy missed seven times oh, and, my word. and they didn't he didn't shoot a buck at all that maybe not entire... from texas in huh? no that was the deal they were from uh I think Georgia. Mm. And so that was where the comment mm. came from. He's like, I love you Texans. Y'all know how to shoot. So, so no, shoot no your... disrespect to our Georgia listeners. No, no, right? no. <laughs> I mean, that just kind of how it happened, but that was the funny comment, you know, as proud Texans, I, I like telling that part of it. But <laughs> so be comfortable 
sh- bring it, bring an adequate gun, be ready to shoot 300 yards. Uh, you're not shooting out of a deer blind. You might, you might be shooting on a rock, but being able to shoot downhill, uphill, just stuff that we don't run into down here. Mm-hmm. So be comfortable with your, you know, you, you've heard that before, but I think it can make a difference, especially up there is you, oh, there's a short window of opportunity and you better be ready. And, and, t- and, you know, I didn't hit that deer where I thought I was going to even. Right. It might have even been a little lucky that I got him. But uh, so have confidence and practice. Yeah. It's good stuff. Good stuff right there. Well, Brody, we really appreciate you coming on for this episode and talking about your hunt. It's an awesome story, and thanks for sharing. We appreciate it. Oh, man, it. it's yeah. fun. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Awesome. And as always, Chance, I know you're just kind of – hanging out here for this episode but thank you for uh, your hospitality and and letting us letting us hang out with you here today oh you bet guys i uh, love having you out and i love hearing the stories from from buddies and brothers absolutely well we'll get uh, we'll get some more stories from you in in the next couple weeks episodes that we got coming out but yeah nick you got anything else nope i'm good man all right guys as always if you haven't already hit that follow and subscribe button to this podcast wherever you get your podcast apps we are there um Go to followupsession.com, check us out, Facebook, Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube, um, and I'll let Nick do his normal spiel on our online store and our apparel. Yeah, if you guys haven't yet, go to our store, uh, followupsession.com slash store, and check out our all of our cool gear. Uh, I have several Fall Obsession shirts, and they are the most wearing comfortable all right shirts. Now. I'm wearing every single shirt, Fall Obsession shirt I have right now. Fanboy. Um, they are some of the most comfortable shirts I own, for sure. Anyway, guys, go check us out online. Give us a like, give us a follow, and uh, we got more awesome hunting and outdoor content coming your way every week and every Monday morning, a new podcast episode. So with that, we will catch you guys next week for another episode of our Fall Obsession podcast. We'll see you later. See you later.